right, open your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 1 and Daniel chapter 2. Acts chapter 1 and Daniel chapter 2. We're continuing our series, it's entitled, The Beginning of Our Story, and I had thought about just kind of doing an overview of the book of Acts, but especially in these first few chapters, there's so much doctrinal significance to the individual words and phrases that we just decided to slow down and take our time. This morning, my intention had been to show you the distinction between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. But it's just too big of a subject for one session. So this morning, we're going to look at the kingdom of heaven, and then, Lord willing, next week, we'll look at the kingdom of God and look at the distinction. And so what I've tried to do is, on your handout, I've printed almost all of the verses that we're going to look up, because it would take us a little bit too much time to turn in our Bibles to each of them. So I've printed them on the handout, other than these initial passages that we're going to look at. So we're going to start in our Bibles, and then we're going to go to the handout. But I hope that you will take the time to look these passages up in your Bible on your own so that you can see them on the page. Now, I know some of you, many, um, especially of a certain generation, will use uh, an iPad or an iPhone uh, for your Bible reading. How many of you are doing that right here? That's what you use, okay? All right, some of us are Luddites, and... but. Have you all noticed how, how fancy I am? Have you all seen this? And it's because I couldn't get my printer to work, and Justin said, just get an iPad. <laughs> he was tired of working on my printer. I thought that was kind of funny. But um, one of the things, <laughs> there's such a long story to that, you wouldn't believe it. But anyway, because Jacob says I am technologically cursed. So one of the things that happens when you use a digital Uh, device for your reading, whether it's reading books or reading the Bible and other things, there's there's a part of your learning that you miss. And now, I'm not against you using the digital, my, my iPad here, I've got thousands of books on this iPad. When I travel, it's wonderful to have this technology. And generally speaking, when I buy a print book, I'm going to get the digital book too, so that I can have it with me. So this is not one is better than the other. But for learning, if you actually find it in your Bible and you see it on the page and you write your cross-references, that's a second component to your learning. You'll remember it better if you'll do that. So if you will, when you get home, look up these passages sometime this week in the Bible and you'll be prepared for next week. That's the first thing. Second, did I tell you where to open your Bibles yet? Okay, Acts 1 and Daniel 2. So... So that's the first thing. Second, this is not going to be, you know, a typical sermon type thing. Obviously, with this handout, this is more of a lesson today, a Bible study. So I hope that this will be a blessing to you, but you're going to have to listen on purpose. And you young people, if you'll get this down, if you'll learn these things that we're showing you here, this is going to sound crazy. You'll know more about how to understand your Bible than almost any Christian you'll meet. This is a neglected part of Bible teaching. And this is not anything that I've invented or come up with on my own. This is just the Bible. And so we'll make a statement and we'll look at what the Bible says about that statement so we can get an understanding of of what do we believe? What is is God talking about in Acts chapter 1? All right, so let's, let's have a word of prayer and let's just dive into this lesson. Lord, we love you. And Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that you have given us this key to understanding your word. And it is one of those things that has to be dug out of the scriptures, but it is clearly revealed. So, Father, help me as I try to communicate this to your people today. Lord, help me to do justice to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Acts chapter 1, and look at verse 3. So, this is Jesus is teaching his apostles to whom also... He, this is Acts chapter 1 and verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, 
being seen of them 40 days. Now, let's just stop right there for a second. In um, the Sunday school hour, we we're talking about, no, I'm sorry, as we see what the apostles were believing, we're going to see that here in a minute in our lesson. Can you imagine how excited they were to see Jesus alive? How many of you think it, it would change you if you saw somebody get up from the dead? And these men were forever changed. And we're going to see in this lesson today, what were they believing? What were they expecting? What were they looking for? But I want you to understand the excitement that these men had. Because Jesus had been teaching them all kinds of things about the kingdom. But now that he's resurrected and he's opened their understanding about some things, and we'll look at those next week, understand the excitement, the, the enthusiasm, the expectation that, that is in this passage. Don't miss that. Okay, verse 3 again. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So for 40 days, he's teaching them about the kingdom of God. Drop down to verse 6. No, so far, can you understand that? We're doing okay, right? Drop down to verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? So he's been teaching them about the kingdom of God, but now in verse 6, they're asking him about restoring the kingdom to Israel. So we need to understand some things. This kingdom to Israel, this is the kingdom that God has promised all through the Old Testament. It's not just the message the apostles were preaching as they're, they're ministering with Jesus on earth. This is the message of the entire Old Testament. This is the foundation, this kingdom of Israel and the restoration of that kingdom. Now, why is that? And, and how, why is this distinction here in Acts chapter 1 so significant? All right, look at your handout. So, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, a scriptural foundation. The kingdom of heaven, a scriptural foundation. So, I want you to notice on your handout, I have highlighted in red, from verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Verse 6, when they were, come, when they were therefore come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? So letter A, what were the apostles believing as evidenced by this question. Now, there are pens available for you in the chair in front of you. Make sure that you have something to write with. You want to take this home with you and, and know what this information is. All right? So, letter A, what were the apostles believing as evidenced by their question? Now, remember, it was Os Guinness, and I might not have it exactly right, but he said, what the, what the heart is believing, or what the mind is asking, reveals what the heart is believing. What the mind is asking reveals what the heart is believing. So, by this question, the disciples were believing some things. What were they believing? Look at number one. The apostles clearly believed Israel would be a kingdom again. The apostles clearly believed Israel would be a kingdom again. Is, is that fair from their question? Will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Number two, they believed this kingdom would be a restoration. It would be a restoration of a kingdom. Number three, they believed that the Messiah would be sitting on David's throne. They believed the Messiah would be sitting on David's throne. Number four, they believed that Jesus would reign over the house of Jacob. Amanda reigns over the house of Jacob right now. 
They believed that Jesus would reign over the house of Jacob. Number five, they believed that Jesus would reign over the house of Jacob from Jerusalem. From Jerusalem. Are you seeing that there were some specific, there's specific meaning, there's specific content to this question. And because of the, the devotional type teaching that is done in Christianity, mostly about how am I going to make it through the day, how am I going to live, all of those things, this most important part of the Bible is often neglected. So let, let's keep going. I almost distracted myself right there. Number six, they believed that Jesus would reign over the house of Jacob from Jerusalem over a regenerated earth. Over a regenerated earth. What in the world is that talking about? Number seven, they believed that they would be sitting on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. They believed that they would be sitting on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Letter B. Why would they believe such nonsense? Jesus had just died. Everything has changed. Why would they believe this nonsense? Not only that, they all died horrible deaths. Does that mean that this promise of the kingdom? Jesus promised them the kingdom, didn't he? This is what they were believing. They all suffered. I believe all of them were martyred. They all died for their faith. What about this kingdom? Why would they believe it? Because a kingdom is promised in Scripture. A kingdom is promised in Scripture. So look at your handout. I have the verses here. Luke 1, 32 through 33. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. That's what they believed. That's what they believed. And, and how do we know that? Because that's written in the book of Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is where the Holy Spirit brought to their remembrance the things that they had been taught. This is what they believed. This is what Jesus Christ had given them. They were trusting in it. Well, letter C, that's great. But what about the specific kingdom details they were believing? Why would they still believe these things? Number one. The apostles clearly believed Israel would be a kingdom again. The apostles clearly believed that Israel would be a kingdom again. Letter A. Why? Because they were Jewish and believed the Jewish scriptures literally. And this is what, remember, this is what the message, this is the message that John the Baptist was preaching. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What were they repenting of? G John was preaching to the, the, the nation of Israel, telling them to repent. To repent of what? They had stopped looking for the Messiah. Why had they stopped looking for the Messiah? Because they had stopped taking those passages from the Old Testament that prophesied the Messiah. They had stopped taking those passages literally. That was their sin. That was their confusion. They were allegorizing those passages from the Old Testament. Why are people so confused today? Why don't people believe that Jesus Christ is going to return and establish a kingdom? Because they are not taking those passages literally today. So the same message that John the Baptist was preaching, that's the same message that Jim the Baptist needs to preach today. Repent. Believe the Bible. Amen? Believe the Bible. They were Jews, and they took the Jewish scriptures literally. All right, that's letter A. Letter B. The dream is certain. The interpretation thereof, sure. What is that from? Now go to Daniel chapter 2. Now 
Look at verse 34. So remember, king had a dream. Brings all of the magicians together. Tell me my dream. Nobody can do it but Daniel. Daniel tells him the dream and gives the interpretation. So here's him telling the dream. So if you look at verse 34. Thou sawest, so why don't we go in verse 31. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of, of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that, that a stone, look at what it says, Thou sawest, that till, thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. So here's this image, picture this statue, and this stone that's, that's cut out but not with hands crushes the feet, and they're broken to pieces. All right? Don't miss the, the flow of it. Verse 35. Then was the iron... The clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. Now, remember what they would do? They'd take the, the wheat, the wheat has dried, and they're going to put it on the threshing floor, and they're going to they're gonna bring wind across it. And the shell, the chaff, will be separated and blown away, and the wheat will remain. All right? So that's what's, that's what's happening here. The wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, that's a strange dream. What does it mean? Well, drop down to verse 44. Here's the interpretation of it. And in the days of these kings, so these four parts of the image, they represent different kingdoms, Greece and Persia and Rome and, and Babylon, all right? And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. Oh. So let, let me tell you what that means. Here's the interpretation. The God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom. That's what it means. So the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom. What do you think we're going to call that kingdom that the God of heaven sets up? It's going to be the kingdom of heaven. The God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom. And then look at what it says about it. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall, be not, shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever for as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. So when does this happen? Look at what it says. It gives us the time. God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. So I want you to understand. Yes, this is a dream. This is a vision. But it is certain and the interpretation is sure. This is going to happen. When? Hereafter. Hereafter. When is hereafter? Go to Revelation chapter 4. I should have said this sooner. If you don't have a Bible with you, there should be one under the, on the, under the chair in front of you. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After this, after what? After the church age, because chapter 3 and verse 22, the verse right before that, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So after God is done speaking to the churches, after this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So that's the exact same time frame that Daniel was talking about. This is, it's going to happen hereafter. After the church age, that's when this is going to happen. 
Okay, now look back at your handout. So number one, the apostles clearly believed that Israel would be a kingdom again. Why? Because they were Jewish and believed the scriptures literally. And the dream is certain, the interpretation thereof is sure. This is what they believed. Number two, they believed this kingdom would be a restoration. They believed that it would be a restoration. Because in Acts chapter 1 and verse 6, will thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? That's their assumption. That's what they were believing, that it was going to be a restoration. Number three, they believed that the Messiah would be sitting on David's throne. They believed that the Messiah would be sitting on David's throne. Why would they, how do we know that that's what they believed? I have the verses there for you, Acts 2, 29 and 30. Men and brethren, let me speak freely unto you of the patriarch David. Patriarch, that's the father. You know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, patriarchs. Let me speak unto you of the patriarch David. Okay, can, can we just do something fun for a second? Look at, um, hold your place. No, you don't have to hold your place in the Bible. Keep your place in your handout. <laughs> Look with me at Romans chapter 9. Patriarch is father. So the Bible talks to patriarchs, it's talking about the fathers. Okay? Verse 1, Romans chapter 9 and verse 1, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ. Look at what it says. For my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites. So Paul was an Israelite, and he's, he, he wants the Israelites to be saved. Verse 4, who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption. Only Israel is the only nation adopted by God. The United States is not adopted by God. Uh, Argentina is not adopted by God. Only Israel. The rest of the nations, the Bible says in the book of Isaiah, are like a drop in the bucket. That's what the Bible says about the rest of the nations. Only Israel is adopted. Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption. That word pertaining is fun in, in uh, uh, Acts chapter 1 and verse 3. Jesus is speaking to them of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. He only talks to them about the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of heaven. Here, he's speaking of things pertaining to Israel, whose are the adoption and the glory and the covenants. The church doesn't have covenants. Isn't that interesting? We don't believe in covenant theology because the covenants are for Israel and we're not Israel. We're the church, all right? And the giving of the law. God didn't give the law to the church. God gave the law to Israel. Amen? How many of you are glad you're not under the law? Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. He's redeemed us from that curse, all right? Who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law in the service of God. We don't make sacrifices anymore. We, we don't, I, I'm not your priest, I'm your pastor. Amen? The, the Levitical priesthood is done. Jesus, that all pointed to Jesus. And when, the, when Jesus died on the cross and that veil was rent in two from top to bottom, now we all have access to the very throne of God through Jesus Christ, the great high priest. But the service was given to the Jews, the service of God, and the promises. What promises? The promises that are talked about in Romans chapter 11, the whole context of Romans 9, 10, and 11, it's all about that God's not done with Israel because the gift and calling of God are without repentance. The promises of God are sure. Oh, verse 5, whose are the fathers? The church doesn't have fathers. The church... Jesus said, call no man on earth your father. The church does not have fathers. Israel had fathers, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Years ago, I was, uh, 
having breakfast with Jacob, and it was always hard for me to talk to kids. I couldn't talk to kids when I was one. So I would always talk to him about the Bible, about doctrine and stuff. And so I asked Jacob, 10, 12 years old, why is it important to be a Baptist? And he thought about it, and he said, because Baptists are the only group without a human father, without a human founder. So the Lutherans have Luther. Presbyterians have Knox. Right? The Methodists have Wesley. The Baptists go all the way back to Christ and his apostles, and Jesus Christ is the head of the church. There's no human founder of the church other than the man, Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord for that. So this father thing, this patriarch thing, it's really important. And this is when we're talking about this kingdom of heaven versus the kingdom of God, here's the primary distinction that I want you all to get. All right, this isn't in your notes, but I want you to get this. And you might want to write it somewhere on your notes. Israel is a physical kingdom. We could all get on a plane tomorrow and fly to Israel. Right? It's a place. It's a nation that wasn't a nation and is a nation again, according to the book of Ezekiel. And and you can go to that place, Israel. The land that God gave to the people, it's still his land, but you could go and stand on that land, that very land, today. It's a, it's a physical place. The church is not physical. It is spiritual. The church is not physical. It's spiritual. Our promises and our life are spiritual, not material. The reason that the, that the, the health wealth gospel, the word of faith gospel... You know, like only believe, where we would differ, one of the primary areas we would differ with, with only believe ministries, one of the primary differences is it's what's called that health wealth gospel. And it's very much a materialistic faith. Now, I'm thankful for every saved person that goes to that church. Amen, aren't you? Praise God for that. But the difference, in our, how many of you know that our church is a little different than their church? The primary difference is we understand, according to the Word of God, that the promises for the church are spiritual, not physical. The kingdom is promised, the kingdom of heaven is promised to Israel. The patriarchs, the fathers, that's flesh. That's uh, physical. Remember what the Bible says, he came unto his own, his own received him not, but to as many as received him, to them gave he power to be called the sons of God, who were born not of the flesh, but of the Spirit. By the way, I was really proud of you all when Brother Dave would ask you verses and you would finish them. Remember, he said, how do you know that? Because we're a Bible-teaching church. Amen? I love it. I love it. So, you see, we're born of the Spirit. Now, how many of you have flesh? If you're not sure, pinch yourself. Okay? We have flesh, but that flesh is what kills us. The Spirit is what makes us alive. So the primary difference between what God was doing with Israel was it was physical. What he's doing with the church is spiritual. Okay, let's keep going. Our water baptism is a picture of our spirit baptism. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For we are all baptized by one spirit into one body. That body is not mystical. That body is Jesus Christ, the body that's seated at the right hand of the Father. Okay, so now let's go back to our uh, look at your handout. Run number three, they believed that the Messiah would be sitting on David's throne. And this is the sermon that Peter preached at the day of Pentecost. So Acts 2.29 on your handout. Men and brethren, let me speak freely unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with him with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, what are those next four words? Everybody read them out loud. He would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. So all of these rules about the Jews, what they could eat, what they couldn't eat, who they could marry, who they couldn't marry, that's all because Jesus Christ was coming in the flesh from them. Are you with me? Right? Okay. 
but he would sit on David's throne. That's why they believed it. Luke 132, and he shall be, it says, he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest, and the Lord shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Okay, stop. I thought, I thought Jesus' human father was Joseph. No. No. His, his seed didn't come from Joseph. So how is David his father? Because he was born of the tribe and lineage of David. That's the physical father. Are you with me? Okay. Jesus didn't have a human father, right? That's the whole idea of the virgin birth. I'll explain that to you later if you have questions. All right. Number four. And they believed, they also believed that Jesus would reign over the house of Jacob. Why did they believe that? Luke 1.33. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. All right? Are you all with me on your handout? You got it? Number five. They believed that Jesus would reign over the house of Jacob from Jerusalem. They had some specific things they believed because Jesus had given specific instructions about this kingdom of heaven. Matthew 25, 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Well, where is that throne? Jeremiah 3.17, at that time, remember that day, that time, that's the day that Jesus comes to return, to sit on his throne. At that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. Jerusalem, the throne of the Lord. And all nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. Won't that be a great day? My God. Goodness, what a wonderful day. Number six, they believed that Jesus would reign over the house of Jacob from Jerusalem over a regenerated earth. Over a regenerated earth. Why would they believe that? Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, the first part of the verse, it's on your hand out there. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory. In the regeneration. What is regenerate? These are the generations of Adam. These are the generations. The generations. So these are the generations of Ty. Simon, son of Tyrone. Anderson, younger son of Tyrone. Eva, daughter of Beelzebub. No, daughter of <laughs> Ty. These are the generations of Ty. These, this is the offspring. This is the birth. What is regeneration? You must be born again. So when the Bible talks about regeneration... When we speak of regeneration, we're speaking of the new birth. How many of you here born again? You are regenerated. That's the new birth. And that's the promise that one day you'll actually get a new body. Praise God for that. So, the, so what is the regeneration of the earth? What's that talking about? Well, we're not going to take the time to go through it today. But during the tribulation period, God destroys the earth. So let's just look at one small portion of it. Go to Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8. So these are the trumpets. And look at what it says in verse 7. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound, verse 7, the first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. Can you imagine what the world would be like with a third of the trees gone and all the green grass gone? You can't breathe. And the second angel sounded, as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. 
And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. Verse 10, And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, and the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. Look at chapter 9, verse 13. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which were bound in the great river Euphrates, and the four angels were loosed which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. Now, what, here, here's what's happening. That's only a small portion of what happens during the tribulation period, that seven-year tribulation period. The world is destroyed. More than half the population of the world is killed. All the green grass is killed. The water is destroyed. The land is destroyed. The air is ruined. It, why? Because the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And if people don't want God, they can't have His creation. It's His. Amen? It's His. So look, go back at your handout. Number six, they believed that Jesus would reign over the house of Jacob from Jerusalem over a regenerated earth. Matthew 19, 28a, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me... In the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit on, his, on the throne of His glory, we're not going to take the time to go there, but in Isaiah chapter 11, it describes that restoration of the earth. Verse 7, I'm sorry, number 7, they believed that they would be sitting on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel because Matthew 19, 28a and Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, part B, down there on your handout, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Wow, that's what they believed. But look, look at letter D on your handout. But again, why would they believe such nonsense? They all died horrible deaths. And there was no regeneration of the earth. There was no restored kingdom. No 12 thrones. What were they believing? Well, they believed what Jesus said. Look at what it says here on your handout. John 18, 36a. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. All right, isn't that a great verse? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. How many of you have ever heard uh, that verse quoted? All right, a couple more minutes and we'll be done. It's so important that you get this. Why does most of Christianity, why do they not believe in a literal thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ on the earth? Most of Christianity does not believe that. They either believe that there's no thousand-year reign. That's called an amillennialist. The millennium is the thousand-year reign. An amillennialist is a person who doesn't believe in the thousand-year reign. A post-millennialist is someone who believes there will be a kingdom, but we're in it. And once that we have, that we, once we have regenerated the earth, once we have conquered the earth for Jesus, and we have spiritual government over the entire earth, once we accomplish that, then Jesus can return. But it's not actually 1,000 years. The 1,000 years shouldn't be taken literally, but that we are in that, that that kingdom began with the resurrection of Christ and will continue until Jesus returns. That's what they believe. And all of those prophecies that we just read, all of those were fulfilled in 70, the year 70 AD when Titus Vespasian destroyed Jerusalem. 
That's what they believe. That's what they teach. Why do they teach that? Because they don't believe the rest of this verse. If you have an ESV, it changes the way that this verse reads. And it removes something very important. Look at your handout. So, number one, John 18, 36, A, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews? So look at the rest of the verse. But now is my kingdom not come from... Or is, I'm sorry. But now is my kingdom not from hence. But now. But now. But now. Jesus let himself be killed. Jesus let himself be taken. He demonstrated, remember, at the Mount of Transfiguration, he met with Moses and Elijah, and what were they talking about? The death that he would accomplish. Well, it's an accomplishment for God to die. And that was the whole purpose of his body. God can't die. So the Father prepared for him a body that could die. That body died for you and for me on the cross. He had to be spat upon. He had to be beaten. He had to be mocked. He had to fulfill all, all of those prophecies had to be fulfilled in him, in his literal and physical body on the cross. And then that body was put in the tomb and rose from the dead victorious, conquering death, hell, and the grave. Praise God. But his kingdom is not yet. His kingdom is not now, but it is coming. It is coming. And the, the confusion is the not now. The not now. So let's, let's continue. Letter E. The restoration of the kingdom to Israel. Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Acts 1 6. The restoration of the kingdom of Israel is the theme of 500 plus passages in the Old Testament. Do you realize how much Bible you have to ignore to miss this? Number two, Isaiah, more than 100 verses. More than 100 verses. Ezekiel, 12 chapters. Jeremiah, 100 plus verses. Daniel, chapters 2, 7, 9, and 12. And then the whole book of Zechariah. This is the theme of the Old Testament. All right, so let's finish it up with this. Look at your handout, number two. Number one is always long, isn't it? Number two, God always tells us what we need to know. What does the Bible say in the book of 2 Peter, chapter 1? He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. All of it. Y'all believe that? So God always tells us what we need to know. So letter A, what is the kingdom of heaven? What is the kingdom of heaven? C.I. Schofield, some of you have a Schofield study Bible. C.I. Schofield said, the phrase kingdom of heaven is peculiar to Matthew. That means it only appears in Matthew. And signifies the messianic earth rule of Jesus Christ, the son of David. It is called the kingdom of the heavens because it is the rule of the heavens over the earth. Remember, Jesus is teaching them how to pray in Matthew 6. We have verse 10 listed. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That was for Israel. The phrase is derived from Daniel where it is defined. This kingdom of heaven is defined in the book of Daniel. And we saw that in Daniel chapter 2. Clarence Larkin, Clarence Larkin's one of the most famous of the dispensational teachers. That's the opposite of covenant theology. If you take the Bible literally, you take the words literally, you are a dispensationalist, okay? Clarence Larkin said it, is, it was the kingdom of heaven, not because it was heavenly or spiritual, but because it was not received from men, but was given from heaven by God the Father. Isn't that a helpful understanding? Sometimes we think of the kingdom of heaven, that must be spiritual. No, heaven's real. Heaven's a physical place. You can look up and see the heavens. That, that, that's physical. It came from God in heaven, not from man. That's why it's called the kingdom of heaven. I thought that was a helpful explanation. A.C. Gabeline, Arno Gabeline, he said, this is, the kingdom of, or this is the kingdom of heavens as promised to Israel and expected by them. It is all earthly. It's an earthly, physical kingdom. Arthur Pink, he says, the Sermon on the Mount is 
quote, the manifesto of the king containing an annunciation of the laws of his kingdom. He also called Matthew the dispensational gospel. Remember, kingdom of heaven is only found in the gospel of Matthew. And it's all Jewish. It's all Jewish. It's all pertaining to the Old Testament. Oliver B. Green, the old radio preacher, he said, The kingdom of heaven in the Greek reads kingdom of the heavens. It is a statement peculiar to the gospel of Matthew. Now, let me just ask you something. Whenever somebody does something like that and they're going to correct it to kingdom of the heavens, how many of you think the King James translators knew how to translate that passage? Right? Now, we understand that the Bible talks about the third heaven. The first heaven is where the birds fly. The second heaven is where the stars are. The third heaven is where God is. That's heavens. But this is a specific characteristic, not of the first heaven or the second heaven, but of the third heaven. That's why the King James translators have it as heaven. That's easy to understand, right? The context defines how you translate. All right, the kingdom of heaven in the Greek reads kingdom of the heavens, but this is a good statement and is a statement peculiar to the gospel of Matthew. It speaks of the millennium, the 1,000-year reign of Christ here on earth when he reigns as the son of David. So God always tells us what we need to know. Number three, God always tells us when we need to know it. God always tells us when we need to know it. Go back to Acts chapter 1. I've got it printed for you on your handout. Acts chapter 1 and verse 7. And he said unto them, number 3 on your handout, do you see that? God always tells us when we need to know it. Acts 1, 7, and he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Now, this is so important. Look, letter B. Notice what Jesus did not say. Notice what Jesus did not say. He did not correct the premise of their question. So look at Acts 1. Look at verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, I'm not going to restore the kingdom to Israel. What are you talking about? Is that what your verse says? No. He said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. So look back at your handout. He did not correct the premise of their question. He did not tell them that the kingdom to Israel will now be a spiritual kingdom. That's what most of Christianity teaches. That's not what the Bible says. Number three. He said, in our words, not yet. Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Not yet. Amen? What does he want them to focus on? He just spent 40 days with them telling them the kingdom of God. The church teaches the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is for Israel. But if we're going to interpret our Bible, we need to know what the kingdom of heaven is. The kingdom of heaven is the kingdom that Jesus Christ is coming to establish on the earth. Can we look at one last passage? Look at the book of Zechariah, second to the last book of the Bible. We spent a little bit of time in Zechariah, didn't we? Zechariah chapter 14. Verse 9. And the Lord shall be king over all the... What's that next word? All right, everybody there? And the Lord shall be king over all the what? In that day, there shall be one Lord and his name one. And all the land shall be turned as a plain. Wow. Jerusalem is going to be lifted up. There's going to be a river that flows according to... Isaiah chapter 11, that flows out of the throne of God and waters the whole earth. Why? Because the rest of the water has been corrupted. Everything changes in the kingdom. That's the theme of the Bible. This church age that we get to be in is simply a parenthesis. Where God said blindness in part has happened unto the Jews until the fullness of the Gentiles be brought in, and so all Israel shall be saved. That's what's coming, folks. 
That's what's coming. But in the meantime, it's our job to tell people about Jesus. We need to know God has told us how to understand the Bible. He's given us the keys to understanding the Bible, and then he's given us a commission. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Because we, if we get focused on this world and how bad it is, then we'll feel like God has failed. God's not failed anything. He told us evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. He told us that this world will degenerate until he takes the church out and comes and judges the rest of the world. That's what the Bible says. Why should we expect anything other than what the Bible says? Amen? So God tells us exactly what we need to know. He tells us when we need to know it. Praise God. And we can know it for sure. Huh? The dream's certain. The interpretation thereof, sure. This is what the Bible says. We can know it. We can know it. The kingdom of heaven. Man, Jesus is coming back. He will be king over the whole earth. The Bible says, we see not yet now all things put under his feet, but they will be. Every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. That's coming. Right now, that's not happening yet. Now we choose to bow. Eventually, you won't be able to. Let's choose to. Amen. He's our Lord. Let's bow before our Lord. Let's all stand together.